Five. Amen. Good to see everyone that is here. God bless you all. We have thoroughly been blessed uh, this day. Uh, we have been encouraging the Lord. Uh, all the sisters had their Bible study, and I'm sure it was power packed. And we had a great Bible study with the men as well. Uh, brothers were just very powerful in statements of scriptures that uh or life changing is what we heard we're thankful to almighty god for allowing us to have so many different teachers that can tell us about the word of god this is our final installment uh, for the hebrews chapter 6 series verses 1 through 12. uh those verses hebrews 6 1 through 12 are the verses that uh we are encouraging you uh to read uh, which is the basic text for the statement. We will pull out the portion uh, that we want to deal with. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, if you will, uh, verse number 2 says, of, of the, well, let's get verse 1 through 3. Those are the main verses we want. But I, we have been reading verses 1 through 12. For the entire understanding, Hebrews 6 and 1. Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. So the idea is to build up a man where you will not how the soul rolled backwards into oblivion. And so we had six parts, this being the sixth part uh, of each one of these topics. This is the final one, eternal judgment. And uh, we want to deal with some word meanings to help our mind uh, comprehend the impact. And I know we see the word eternal all the time, and uh, but I want to read uh, the meaning of this particular word, eternal judgment, G166. Uh, you may have Strong's numbers, NT166. Uh, it deals with perpetual, also used of past time or past and future as well. Eternal, forever, lasting. World began. And we want to have our minds set as we embark on this topic because the Lord is letting us know it is unchangeable whatever the judgment is if it's good it cannot be changed the beauty of going to heaven dying and going to paradise waiting on the Lord is it never changes there's a great gulf uh, the writer of Luke says between both worlds it's too big to cross over, so it'll never change. You're not, it's not too big for God to cross over, but he's never going to change his mind and send us back. At the same time, the lost portion, the lost world, it's too big to cross over. And he's definitely not going to get the lost and bring him over to the side of the saved. So we have to comprehend and accept and understand in our heart, it is important to understand the impact of eternal it cannot be changed. And this is the power. By God. See brethren. The important thing of understanding. There are certain things that God. Cannot do. If he wants to remain righteous. And he will not do it. So when we say. There's nothing that God can do. We understand that. But, but God operates off a system. That he is perfect. God cannot change eternity of where he places you at the judgment it will not be revoked and your future is determined by your walk on the earth at the time that you're living those who are not born they have to be judged but the lord knows what they would have done that's why he was able to pick jacob over esau before they came out and did anything before man and his judgment was correct jacob was better than esau but the idea is that 
God knows what a person is going to do. And the decision is made based on the heart of the man. And God is not going to change that decision. So it would cause you and I to take heed, as he said, and be careful how we hear. A lot of people do not take their walk with the Lord or their walk on earth serious. Some of you have, well, everybody's had something like a job or school or team they were on or a chore given by the parents or something they had to do where they had a partner that was just not as excited about it as they were. And it's very grievous. Even children can relate to what I'm saying. It becomes very grievous. If a little kid wants to play a game and say, come on, this is going to be fun. I don't like that. And he kicks the ball. You don't want to play. Okay. It's grievous now because they're not as zealous as you are about this game. But we have to understand, if it stayed like that forever, that child would never have fun with that person. Because they would kick against everything that that person wanted to do. Now, let's look at the meat of the lesson as we go into the 25th chapter, uh, which is what was read. Now, we're going to look at Matthew 25, and in this, we're going to explain some word meanings that will help us understand the power of this statement also. Matthew 25 and 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. But the goats on the left. Now the goats are the rejects. They are not like the sheep. If you know anything about it, the animal came, the goat is different. He's got the horns, very rough. He's a different type of a beast. But the sheep are referred to as the chosen of the Lord. And so verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now this is the list of things we're concerned about. Verse 35, for I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Now, I want to stop here and deal. We want to deal with these words, because these words are critical to us getting an understanding of what this is saying. If you notice something odd about uh, verse 35, food and drink are separate. Now, brethren, just stop and ask yourself a question. If someone told you they were hungry, is that all you give them is food without a drink? If they told you, man, I've been stuck out here for three days, stuck in this car, man, I am starving. And all you give them is a sandwich and walk away. You wouldn't give them nothing to drink. See, when you see the Lord separate things that always accompany each other when a person is hungry these things accompany this is a red flag this is spiritual because if you have not eaten why would i just give you something to eat and nothing to drink now stop for a minute i said do you know you can live longer without food than you can without water so why are they separate then i'll put them together as a meal why are they separate because they're spiritual the Lord talks about the two. Before we go any further, we're going to show how he separates eating and drinking when he's talking spiritual. And this is how you keep the text going in congruent with the spiritual walk of the saint. Now let's go to John 6. Let's go to John 6. And we're going to see how he separates food and drink because he's talking about things spiritual. Okay, Jesus says in John Chapter number 6 and beginning at verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. There's no bread that can cause you to live forever. That is real bread. Because how do we know that? He's going to explain 
that verse 49, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. Now, if you remember the story, manna comes out of heaven. It is not baked by any of the Jews. It comes out from heaven. If you look it up, it'll describe it as light like a wafer and had kind of a honey taste. It was something that they could comprehend the flavors, but it came out of heaven. Well, why could they not live forever? Because it is a food made for their bodies. He's talking about a food made for the spiritual man. So now he explained just because it came from heaven don't mean it can keep you alive forever. He said your fathers died. Mm -hmm. But he's saying I came from heaven. But if you eat this bread you will never die. Now he hasn't talked about drinking yet. So he says in verse 50, uh, 50 uh, uh, verse number 50 1 I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh. Now, he really hits a deep gill on us on that one. Which I will give for the life of the world. So, okay, I'm going to give this. My flesh. So he explains. So now he's sent a message that, okay, he's bread. Eat me, basically. The flesh. So the Jews therefore struggle among themselves, verse 52, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And literally it does sound weird and odd, but they're supposed to hang around till he breaks it down, whenever he decides to break it down. Verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You see the separation. This is and the reason it's so critical, brethren, to understand why he separates it in Matthew 25, because one is the word and one is the spirit. One, anytime you see blood, Jesus could not possibly have taken blood to heaven. No flesh and blood can inherit. So if you were to bring blood to heaven, it can't make it all the way up there. It can't go inside. So he took his spirit into heaven. This is why he says, drink it in. How do we know those two match together? Before we go any further, we have to have these pieces. So when we read, it reads like water flowing. Now, let's go over to 1 Corinthians. Hold your hand on the two marks we got so far. Matthew 25, John 6. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, if you will. Chapter 12. We're going to see the explanation extremely clear now. And we are done on this portion. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. But by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free. And have been all made. Here we go. To drink into one spirit. So that's how you're saved in baptism. You have to have the sins washed away. And you must drink the spirit. In, and then you're clean. And you can be added into the kingdom. Now. Do we have a reference. That makes this particular thought even clear yes let's go to john chapter 7 even more clear john 7 and look at verse number 37 in the last day that great day of the feast jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You know out of man's stomach, no water going to be coming out like that. No holes to let it. If you do, you die. Something's wrong. So now he's talking straight spiritual as in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But this, now here's the answer. 39. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So when we go to 1 Corinthians, Holy Ghost has already been given. We understand that because Acts chapter 2 has already happened. So now we have something to hold on to. Now let's go back to John 6 if we can. And then we're going to now read again and go into verse 53. Again. Then Jesus said unto them, John 6, 5, 3. Truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. That's the word we're looking for, eternal. And I will raise him up at the last day. 
verse 55 for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed so we have two spiritual applications when an individual based upon what we've already seen in Hebrews is about to go into the word of God he must or she must be able to chew or separate the word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God. A work when that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. Okay, so, so it's like when you look at these words, it's like you've got to be able to break apart. You might have a section here that doesn't belong to what you're trying to do, but it needs to be there to explain because God is talking to people there. People some in the past he'll make a reference to and some that have yet to be born. So we have to know. We look okay. Well, yeah, that couldn't possibly be talking about now. And so we should know. Somebody say, how do we know that? Because you're supposed to look at the word. Nobody drinks blood. Not of the Jews and not of the Christians. Nobody at no time for any religious purpose. So that all not going cancels it out. They talking about real blood, but still, I don't know what he's talking about. They're saying we know because we have all these other meanings that are added that makes the book complete. Now you know why Paul writes in First Corinthians thirteen that when that which is perfect is come, that completed writings, that which is in part is done away. You don't need the parts anymore because the Lord is okay. Everything is together. You got the book before you, all the sections here a little, there a little. The Bible says in Proverbs, a man makes a statement, then his neighbor comes and shows where he's in wrong, where he's wrong. Okay, that's fine. You want the neighbor to come and show, because you don't want to go to hell with the wrong idea. We shouldn't get angry if we show, okay, you missed this. Okay, oh great, thank God, thank God. I got it now. So here he says, if you eat his flesh, verse 54, and drink his blood, you have eternal life, and he will raise us up at the end, at the last day. He says, indeed, in actuality to what your soul not your body verse 55 is saying indeed for what purpose factual truth for my flesh is meat indeed food for what the soul for your soul and he says my blood is drink indeed you drink it in we've got two scriptures first Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 John chapter 7 verse 37 through 39 so we've got all that we need to know okay every time we see drink we see blood we're talking about taking in the spirit and that's not a glass of the Holy Ghost poured in no that's talking about to accept in the spiritual power the spiritual meaning and the spiritual understanding saints like a lot of children because we are children of God a child will eat something and if they don't like it, the minute you turn your head, they'll chew it, and they know the napkin trip. Wow! Pants, check his pants full of dry green beans. Spit it out. But he got no nutrients from the food. Because it has to be chewed, digested, and the stomach breaks it up. I say, okay, I need this nutrient. The rest goes out the drop. If he doesn't take it in. So we have to understand it. an individual must take the word of God his soul and chew it yeah. swallow it and let the spiritual drink flow through yes. and you got and that's what stops the same brother nice. yeah, that holds yeah. us up we get that word we read it looking at it amen but when that spiritual drink come napkin time spitting it out you can't do it brother you can't you will not develop you will not grow and that's what he told that's why we started this series from the Hebrew letter explaining milk that we know about a baby gives a baby strong bones muscles and teeth he needs that can't eat meat with our teeth can't nobody gonna be pureeing everything here can't eat meat with our teeth can't work and lift with our bones can't do things without strong muscles to function spiritually you must take in the meat the milk and this believe it or not all the subjects we studied uh, we had seven lessons actually one on one part two it was pretty deep so we made two parts these are milk subjects you would be surprised how many saints do not understand and comprehend the laying on of hands but the Hebrew writer says that's milk 
And he says, you Hebrews will not move forward as Christians to the deep stuff we have. And I'm telling you, brethren, we're going to bring out some more stuff here in the next few weeks. And it's the kind of stuff that's going to make somebody very angry if they have not drank the milk. Because when you read some of these answers, it is a in your face, you have been wrong for 32 years and are wrong right now type of answers. Written the Bible, always been. Don't do no judgment, just read it. You know what I mean? But that's what the man has to do. So when the Hebrew writer writes, he's not writing this to teenagers, he's writing this to grown saints. He's writing this to some who are priests who have gone to Christianity. And he's telling them, we can't give you the heavier subjects. And it's not nothing new, like a different Jesus. It's just deeper about Jesus and the same thing that we've read. See, when you understand about milk comes from a cow, but you eat the meat of the cow. Same animal, then the same animal. But if you don't have no teeth, you can't compete. Not like a, a new thing gonna be made up. The Hebrew writer is not a crook. He's writing down the depth of how deep God's understanding can go and cause you to be spiritually strong. Because that's a heavier problem coming down the road. And the devil's got a warehouse full of stuff with your name on it. But the, the law won't let him. Even when, if you pull out one song, that's too heavy. They're not ready for that to put it back. But when the Lord says you should be ready and you still get whooped, and it happens all the time, it's our fault. The Lord says when your trial comes and you faint, he says that it was because you're weak. He said because you should have been ready. See, he won't let it come through until you're ready. But not meaning that he can't see your heart is not ready. Should be ready. If that's the case, then why do people die lost? Because they should be ready. Because the Lord has reached yes. for them. Yes. But they have rejected and fought and wrestled and twisted it to their destruction. Second Peter chapter 3. And that's what we do not want for anyone. And so therefore, when we look at this, he says in verse 56, uh, oh, give me verse uh, 56. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. You need the other part. See, you can be in the Lord. I say, well, how's that problem? Well, you can be in the Lord and have quenched him and he's out. You know, you can be in a room and put a fire out. You're in the house, but you just put the fire out. That's what he's saying. You can be inside, but you have quenched the spirit or grieved him. And that's going to be a problem for you and I. Verse 57, as the living father has sent me and I live by the father. See, Jesus understood the terminology. I live because of the Father. Now, he hadn't died at this point, but he said, I'm alive. I'm alive with spiritual power and strength because of my Father. Not because of myself. That's why when I said good master, not that he was a crook. He is a good master. He said, but why callest thou me good? There's only one good but the Father. Because he's not, the man that's looking at his friends. Like the man, Jesus, the guy, Jesus that does all these great things. But he's saying, okay, it's not me that's good. It's the Father that is in me. So he that eateth meat. Man, that sounds like one of those beef jerky commercials, doesn't it? He that eateth meat, even he shall live by me. So if you consume the words of the Lord, as he has said, they are bread. That's what he is. How do we know that? Jesus is the word. How do we know that? John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. He is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. And it came among us and dwelt. Jesus' word. So now it's okay. Okay, so that's why I use those terms. Okay, it's flesh, word, eat, consume. You eat flesh, but nobody eats a human flesh, but a cannibal. And this is what makes the people go, this guy, how are we going to eat his flesh? And this is what's wrong with people when they hear a spiritual statement. How is that possible? Questions should happen after that point. Questions. And they didn't ask, and some of them are going to lead to their own destruction. He said, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. That's twice he said it. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Why? Because the bread came down from heaven. He said he's the bread he came down from heaven, but he's the one that brings everlasting life. That bread, that wafer that tasted like honey, that was light, that brought them physical life and kept them alive physically. He will bring them spiritual life and keep them alive spiritually. Let's drop down to verse 62. Oh, let, 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 no, no, no. We want to catch what they, when they, they're going to get off on in verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? What's hard about what well, 
you know, we, we, we milk fellas. Man, this heavy duty stuff here, man. We having trouble with this. And he says in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Now look at verse 62. Why doesn't he break it down and say, let me tell you what it means. You know why? Because you're talking crazy in your heart. That's why. And I'm fixing to give you something even deeper than that to show you really don't know nothing. Why would he do that? Because when you talk stupid to Jesus, he turns us off. And he don't hear you, brethren. How can this be? Why has it got to be like this in a church? Click off. And then he comes up with a statement that really 747s over the head. Look at verse 62. This is not actually like this. is deeper. He's taking them down to the depths of the water where the fish light up. He's taking them deep. Look at verse 62. What well, if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He says, I'm going back to heaven, man. That's too heavy. That's even heaven. Now they really think he's crazy. Watch. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profited nothing. Your flesh is useless. That's why the Lord put the sins and it's going to die. Whether he returns and you're still alive, he's going to make it drop, judge you, give you a new body, and the flesh is going to get tossed, rolled up like a scroll with the earth, tossed into the pit because it's useless. It's good for the earth only. So let me tell you something now to drop this thought out real quick as we're passing through here. Don't leave your spouse because somebody looks better than them. It doesn't matter if they stay that pretty till the day your eyes close. They're still going to die. See, one of the things we don't understand about flesh, people say, well, it's going to get old. Well, some people might look pretty good all the way to the graveyard. And have your eyes still, I love you for the day I met you and you die, but somebody got to die. Somebody checking out. And that's the problem with a lot of saying you're not going to keep them. So why can't you love the person you have? Because we're evil. That's why, brethren. And the Lord says, I have a place for you when you like that. I'm going to put you in there because he said, you're not worthy of me. You can't even love a person. How you cannot love somebody you sleep in the bed with, eat dinner with, wash up almost with, go places with, ask money from each other, and you can't, but she, this other girl, she does everything I need, man. You lost your mind. You deserve to go to hell. You lost your mind, sister. I'm telling you now. They don't do nothing different. That's in your mind, the image from Satan, just like he made those cows. Those two stupid gold cows, and Aaron has enough sense of ignorance to say from one, this was brought you out of Egypt. And then this clown, Jeroboam, makes two. This brought you out of Egypt. A stupid cow, if you say thank you, he won't say okay. The Lord says, he has eyes, he cannot see, he has ears, he cannot hear, a mouth, he cannot talk, he cannot smell, he is dead. And we got to understand that. Why would you take a doctrine that isn't even keeping the person alive that's teaching it spiritually and thinking it's going to keep you alive? It's an image of death. Yeah. And you should be able to see. And the judgment is eternal. And it will never change. And so we have to understand when we see that, he says, fresh prophet, nothing. Now here we go. Now we see what he's talking about when we kept it. He's talking about flesh. Oh, I'm talking about flesh, but I still haven't seen. Here it is. The words that I speak unto you. That's what he wants you to eat. They are spirit and they are life. So he's not talking about his skin. Not talking about loaf bread. You eat with or without yeast. The word. So that's why he said, okay, my skin prophets. No, he know that it's in the sea. Now he breaks down. What you, think? you really think I want you to eat my skin? The skin prophets nothing he says to them. The words I speak. That's what I want you to eat. And the words have a spiritual meaning to them. And that's what he wants you to drink. And me too. And so verse 64. But there are some of you that believe it not. Or believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that would believe not. Or that believe not. And who should betray him. And he said therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given. Unto him of my father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. And that's just like people listen. They tell me, Man, this dude crazy. Let's go. That's just how people. When I can't understand something, I'm market crazy and I'm out. And have I accomplished anything? Not a thing. Am I still lost? Yes. Matter of fact, I'm even worse off now than I was before because at least he was breaking it down for me. And now I get zero when I leave. That which I had is taken from me. 
We have to understand that and hold on to it, brother. Because when you get over to Matthew 25, which we first go to now, this is a cakewalk now. It's a cakewalk. Because all these terms deal with spirituality. Let's go back over to Matthew 25. And we're going to read the statements about this. We're going to show that these words deal with spiritual things. We understand we have to help our brother James cover that, others cover it. See your brother warm, he, uh, naked, and how you tell him be warm and feel. You got to give him something to eat. You got to give him something to drink. You got to take care of it, physically give him some clothes. But Jesus is talking about something heavier than that within these physical words, which are inclusive, but not the final thought. Because we're going to show some of these things the devil deal with, and he is one hundred percent spirit and you cannot put a spirit in a physical jail now we're going to show this now let's look at matthew 25 let's pull these words up and we're going to give you a number you can look them up so you don't think i'm trying to pull a fast one over just give you some meaning so i can look at some educated giant which i am not nor am i trying to look like one so look at matthew 25 and we're going to look at verse number 35 okay the scripture says here that if I was hungry and you gave me meat okay now as, as the Lord deals with this particular term he says and I was thirsty and you gave me drink I was a stranger and you took me in and he's going to they're going to ask him these same questions again concerning that how did we feed you what it is that makes you think we gave you something to eat when you see the word meat M-E-A-T. Yes, it means meat, but we want to look at what is it saying here in the book of Matthew 25 and verse number 35. This word is G5315 or NT5315. This word is primary verb uses alternate in certain senses to eat, literally, figurative. Now watch what the word means. Now, brother, this is why it's important. I encourage you all to look at word to eat meat see he says you gave me meat but the word listen what the word means to eat me so he's saying you gave me to eat meat and he's explaining you gave me something to consume something to eat now Jesus has talked all throughout about the words are necessary it is the word what did the Lord say? Do not labor in John 6 for meat which perishes. Yeah. Don't labor for that. Don't work for it. He said, but everlasting. It's important to understand this is eternal judgment. This has to do with something heavier. And when you get all the words out of you'll see, man, these words talk about something way more than food and clothes and prison bars. So, well, he mentions that. He says, I was thirsty. He mentioned that one. Now let's see what he's talking about. See, because there's always a meaning inside the word to tell you, okay, the Lord is trying to tell us we're going to have to do more than what the denominational world do, run around giving people something to drink. We're talking about something that can give them everlasting life. G1372. He says, and look what this deals with. You won't see the word water here, brethren. You hear me? A beverage or wine. Listen to what I mean. G1372 or NT1372. To thirst for. That's what the word means. Now, now listen what it says. He says, I was thirsty. So he was thirsty for something. Now this isn't Jesus. This is the people they serve. This is the people called your brethren. I want you to remember this and you can search it out. Jesus has never called the lost his brethren. Search it out. Look it up. Do the research. He always refers to his brethren as those that are belong to the law either through Judaism or through Christianity. No, because they're not his brethren yet. They're not. So this is something you have to go and do to your brothers in Christ. We we'll always talk about who the Lord come to first when he came to earth. Let's go say to his own. Came to the Jews first. Why did he go to the Gentiles of law? No, no, no. My children are first. My father's children are first. They get the bread. Crumbs drop to the Gentiles. You get second fiddle. Because these are the children. They get first. Brethren, you can't discredit each other 
and treat each other like old worn out shoes. Uh, you know, saints, they got bad attitudes. Anyway, people in the church, nothing but devils. Anyway, see, you don't understand. The only people on the earth that the Lord care about is the ones you call them devils in church. Because the ones outside of the kingdom, the laws I have absolutely no relationship with them. They take care. They oh, I give them food. They cry to me for more food. I give it to them. They don't want me. They want the stuff. But you have to understand, brethren, you have to make it happen with brethren. The soul is valuable enough to labor with, to miss dinner, to have a belly full of coffee, not a crumb full of food because you're trying to stay woke to help somebody. Spiritually comprehend things to understand and to grasp. This is what the judgment will be about. How did you minister to them spirit? When the Lord washed the disciples' feet, he told them, You have to wash your feet. You don't see no record of them going around with feet, pity your feet dirty. Because it was a spiritual. And Paul washed feet as Peter's dirty, nasty feet real good in the book of Galatians. Because his feet were full of nonsense, prejudices, and separatism type thinking against Gentile. Dirty foot Peter. And after his feet were clean, he said, my beloved brother Saul. Because he appreciated him cleaning him up. Paul had to have his dirty feet walked for. Got himself entangled with James and about to get killed. Had to send the Gentile police to rescue him. Because he wanted to say he wasn't teaching a forsake Moses. But that is what he taught. And there was no way to hide it. They knew him. Look, this is him, Israel. This is the one that's doing wrong. Help me. Help us. Let's kill him. Because he's talking against Moses. And he knew exactly what he was doing. We're talking about spiritual works. Not talking about nobody's body. Not in this context. Now let's look and see. Let's get some more information. It says to thirst for literally or figurative. That's the key word you're looking for. Literally or figuratively. Imagery. It's an image to thirst for. Be thirst. It says you came and you... You took care of my thirst. What I needed. If I'm thirsting for the spirit of God. To get me off drugs. To get me off alcohol. To help me stop beating my wife. To help me stop pouring grits on my husband. To help me stop stealing and changing the time. Because I'm getting two checks. And I don't even go to work no more. To help me stop that. You got to give me some spiritual meaning. From these words that I'm chewing on. I got to take it in. And that's what it's about. So often we miss this part of the work. And a lot of them are like, man, I can't help them. They're still on the mill. They don't even understand. They're not doing the spiritual work. And I don't mean we here. We on the earth, the saints of God. I say, now, you look at the thought. Because when he says, you gave me meat. He develops the understanding in the 35th verse. Because he was hungry. Hungry. Desirous to eat, to consume what would make the life right again? So he said, you know, you gave me meat. You took care of what I needed. Because when you look at, see, saints, what you're looking at is the word that he lacked shows it was a spiritual lack. So that's how you know he didn't bring in physical food. See, that's why you, you take verse 35. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me meat. See, that's the key. Look at the word. We're going to look at another word. Because this is the only way to explain it. Is to explain. Remember. The words tell us what the context is about. So if you want to make context. It's like some Martian. Context is what you read. This is context. When the son of man shall come in his glory. Verse 31. That's context. That's me. We got to find out what those words mean. To see what is the Lord talking about. And that's why it's important for us to know that. Look at the word hunger. Uh, G3983. G3983. Through the idea of pinching toil pie to famish. Absolutely, comparatively, figuratively. That's the image word. It's an image to crave, be, and hunger. See, the image is I'm hungry. So you brought me what I needed to feel this craving that I had. Craving for the word of God. I need to be taught. And so, now what else does he deal with? He says, I was a stranger. And you took me in. And see the idea. Now you're looking at. Now we get into some words now. That if an individual understands. The Lord says. All throughout the Old Testament. The stranger without your gate. What did the Lord say to do with the stranger? He said because you were strangers in 
Egypt, and they took care of you. So they, they gave you a place. To live. We have to understand the history of what the Lord is teaching. The history of Israel is, you know they went into the land with nowhere to live. They didn't have no food back in Canaan. It's game over. Joseph is there, and he is in control, and he gives them ghosts and the best property they had. That's their house. Now, they didn't have nowhere to live. So they were strangers. They were taken in. He said, so don't forget the strangers. When they got there, he said, don't forget you were strange in Egypt. He said, you remember how they took care of you? When you left, they gave you something. Because see, when he told them, this is how you'll spoil the Egyptians. They run around. If I knew Winfrey, Winfrey, can you give me that gold thing? Hey, give me, give me them shoes. I'm going to take them with me when I go. And Winfrey knew me. I was like, okay, yeah. He said, you spoiled them. That's how you spoiled them. You took their stuff and you left with their stuff. He said, but they gave it to you. So he said, don't forget the stranger. But a stranger was without the foreigner. It's okay. If he's going to be around, pass over. He ain't the meal. Got to get that knife and cut him. Feel man, got to cut him. Got to circumcise him. Can't eat this meal unless he's circumcised. He'll be held accountable for the problem that is to come. He'll be condemned. So you got to cut him. So the idea is you have to look out for the stranger. You got to look out for the foreigner to make sure the individual understands, okay, well, how can I take care of this guy? If you're a stranger, stranger, well, how do you know how to be saved? How do you know what to do once you're a Christian on your life, your marriage? You're strange, it's foreign, you're foreign information. You walk around and say, well, how, how, how do I function in this new world? 3581, G3581. It says, foreign, alien, figuratively, novel by application, a guest, entertainer, host, stranger. Have you ever gone somewhere, even to a church of Christ, to visit out of town, and you don't even know what door to get in? You pull in, oh, it's not in. I say, hey, it's over here. You're trying to come to church. It's over here. You grab on the door. They don't know about it. using 10 years. But you didn't know. You don't go there. And you walk in, and you walk in. You thought, the oh, this is a restroom here. We're going to come through this hallway. Okay. They got to tell you where to go. You don't know what's going to happen first. You've never been there. You, you, where you go. They say, they say a song and then come on song, scripture read, and then they go to the message. Over here, they start serving the law something immediately when you walk into that. They ran the law something already. You don't know what's going on. So we have to understand is we have to be told what to do spiritually as well. Some people in the church, they get married. They have to be given scripture to understand how to handle things, how to conduct themselves within the marriage. You have to be told. I'm a stranger to this. I'm kind of far to this. I'm new to this. Having a baby for the first time, I say, oh, mother knows. Oh, mother don't know. You know how I know mother no more? Because Titus says there's a man that has to teach old women how to teach young women how to love their children. I thought a woman knew automatically how to love a child. Now, why does the text say that? Is it lying? Is it wrong? It's right. See those old wives, that's what the Bible here, the Bible says, old wives tell, that's old wives tell, old wives favor. A mother no, a mother don't know, no, she don't, she has to be taught. That's why there's so many lousy mothers on the earth. Because somebody's not teaching them, baby, you gotta love your child. Spank that butt when they act bad. Don't hug them, spank that butt. Discipline them, take some parents away. Because you don't know. You say, well, no, God didn't make you to know just because you came out your belly. No, you don't. And a dude that never had a wife teaches an old woman, read Titus chapter 1, how to teach a young woman. Boy, this deep in the non-meat eaters, get prepared. A old woman to teach a young woman how to love her husband and her children. How can he do that? He don't even have a wife or a baby. Because he knows God. And God made the woman and the baby. And the old lady, and the preacher, and the church, and he also brought forth Jesus Christ. That's what it's about, brother. You don't touch this, he'll worry about a bunch of nonsense talking whether it's old men favor or old wives favor. Doesn't matter what gender. It's about the Word of God provides everything Peter said this morning we read that pertains to life and godliness. Want to be a good mother? Get you a Bible. Want to be a good child? Get you a Bible. Read it. Suck it in and believe it. If you can't, it's because you're not a Christian or you're not walking like one. Because we got too many people coming up with thoughts all on the earth about uh, what we should do. And everybody's spinning around like papers in the wind with elders, deacons, and evangelists in some churches. It shouldn't be that way. This is eternal judgment. It will not change. And it will be determined by the time you close your eyes on this earth. 
God will know this one's going to heaven and this one's going to hell. Before you get out of that, but he already knows. Once them eyes shut, game over. That's right. Judgment done. I just got to tell you. That's all the law saying. I just got to tell you when you come before me. And so we understand that. Now let's look at it. He says, uh, naked and you clothe me. So the idea is, what, what, what am I going to do with the clothing part? How does this thing carry so much weight? What is so detrimental about being unclothed? Well, let's see if we can pull up what clothed means, and then we'll know. G41, G, forgive me, G4016, G4016. Throw all around, that is, invest with a palisade or with clothing. Palisade. Array, cast about, put me on. What does the Bible say? Hold your hand right there. Let's go to Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter number 3. Look what it says about Jesus. Paul is writing to saints already baptized and reminding them how they should act because they got Jesus on. This is not lost he's writing to. This is the same. Look at Galatians 3, 26. For you are the children of God. That's the text. By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's the text, and we can see it clearly right there. We see the scriptures as they continually tell us about put on the new man, yank off the old man. Why? Because we're wearing the wrong clothes. When we do not keep Christ on as we're supposed to, we are wearing the wrong clothes. So you have to take off the old man. Because We'll put him on every now and then so we can look as we're looking good today. That old man back home, I'm acting crazy. Women looking at you, men looking at you, acting crazy, flirting at the job, know you how to be right with Jesus. Guys come up and say, girl, your legs something there. You say, yeah, that's why my husband like it. Yeah. See, now we do. Now everything's scratch, wreck, and root. They go, ooh, she busted you. That's right. Now go on back to your work area and shut up back like you got some sense. And go on and work. Because you got to stop that nonsense when it kick off. They'll be doing it all the people. I thought she was a Christian. She letting that man all up on her talk. See, now they're talking about you blaspheming God. And then your life starts to get unraveled. Children start talking crazy. You wonder, what's going on with my life? You just tell Billy, stop flirting with you at work. That's what's wrong. If that's the case. Just one quick example. That's all. So we have to understand that the law is talking about spiritual clothing. Not physical. Spiritual. Spiritual. We have to understand that. He says, here's another one. That's the one here we want to deal with here. He says, you visited me when I was in prison. We want to pull up prison. We're going to validate that the Lord is not simply dealing with iron bars. Prison. The 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, verse number 36. So I was in prison and you came unto me. Prison 5 four three eight g5 four three eight it says here a guarding or concretely guard it can mean you know it's plain as just saying prison i can say prison i can mean guard with this greek word see this greek word means guard like a guard the actual person watching the act of the parson figurative the place the condition figurative that's a key word see figurative brother that means that when this word is used Jesus used the word about his body called bread. That was about real bread. So we understood, okay, he's not calling himself real bread. This word can be used and it means it's an image. It's figurative the minute you say it. It doesn't have to have any application. The minute you say it, it can mean figurative. Because the meaning is figuratively, it says the place, the condition, specifically the time. It can be a time. See, you can be, you can be a time in your life. Well, you jammed up. Listen to me, brother. That's the mean. I'm giving you numbers so you can look it up. Oh, damn, put no fast. No, he's not. And you can look it up. Read it for yourself. You read it for yourself. A time as a division of day or night. Literally or figurative. All of them are literally or figurative. Cage, hold, in prison, ward, watch. Why am I saying that? Brethren, you have people that are in prison in their mind that they think that they are worthless and useless to God. You understand you got to go visit them and tell them no you're not. 
God has dipped you in his son's blood, caused you to drink his blood in. You've tasted the word of God. You have the spirit in you. You're the greatest person on the earth out of all of the people that are not Christian. You're somebody in part of the law. You just got to understand you need help in your walk. You got to visit them. You can't go on there talking crazy. Girl, you get your raggedy life together. You can't go on there talking silly like that to people. They're not going to listen to you. Man, man, like the Wayne was teaching us the damn Bible. Man up. Man up. Grab your bootstrap. Man, like that needs to be explained. How do I grab my bootstraps? How do I man up? Can you tell me? I don't know what to tell the person. You can't go read your Bible. <laughs> See, do you know how many saints do that? Keep listening to saints. Visit one, go with one on one day. Watch what they say. You'll be shocked. They don't know what to say. They think by their presence alone, the person don't get it right. No, they not. They need to be told details, and you need to find out about what's going on. Why do you feel that you're useless? Why do you feel, I just feel like my life has been nothing. What makes you feel that way? Well, my children, they calling, and they said, you know, I need to get myself together. Because look, I, I can never make good decisions. I just feel so bad because I think they're right. Your children are crooks and disrespectful little devils. What kind of child would tell their parent that? What have you done to bring that? Didn't you, didn't you do things? Didn't, didn't you just get this child a car and you tell them that? You have to know what to tell them. They're going to say, why would you accept such nonsense out of their mouth? You need to take that car back you gave them. Let them see what it's really like to have nothing. See, you got to know. You have to know that uh, you can't get up there. <laughs> you can't get, and you know what's sad? When some, you know, some people just cannot tell people what to do. They don't need to go nowhere but study their body. <laughs> You know, when you hear people disrespecting parents, you understand that God is on the side of the parent. Unless the parent has done something directly at that moment, can't bring up nothing no 20 years ago. I'm not talking about no father. I'm talking about 20 years ago, I mean, some mistake that was made, some problem. You understand that? I said, why are you letting them bring stuff up like that in the past? you parent, parents. You love them. You, haven't you prepared them? Haven't you been there for them? So why don't you continue to realize they don't they're not God they can't judge your life in the same way if a parent does that to a child unrighteously <clears throat> or if a spouse does that to a spouse or if a co-worker has beat you down my boss told me data he cussed me out told me get out of his face and he'll call me when he's back and I just I feel so useless now I, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills you aren't judged by the amount of money in your pocket and the type of job you you're judged by the content of spirituality that is in you see you have to know what to say you, don't you know what to say about it? Well, what would Jesus tell them? Of course he would tell them their value. Of course he would lift them up and explain them. And that's what we do, brethren. They're in prison in depression. No, I don't take them to the psychiatrist. They don't tell them what they're going to come out after that. You talk to them. person has to stop and understand what this word prison means. Now, if you're thinking, it's, okay, let's go to Revelation. I'm going to validate same number, G5438. Now, when you look over here, Revelation 20 and 7, you think Satan in an ironclad jail? You're thinking in an ironclad jail? Acts 20 and 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. The same way, he's not in no real jail. How you gonna put a spirit in a jail? Spirit, come on, he can't, can't put a spirit in iron bars. But he's in something imprisoning him, and the law says, I'm letting him out, I'm letting him out. I'm letting him loose. After a period of time that the saints have reigned and ruled, the devil was allowed to be loose. And that fool is loose. You <laughs> that fool is out and acting crazy. So the prison, you have to understand, is a restriction. Sometimes it's for a period of time. And people need a visitation. And do you see the thrust of this when a brother read it? This is a commandment, brethren, based on if you go to hell or heaven for not doing. I hope you can see that and understand that. Your soul is going to be judged on this. If you think it's physical, do you know that there are some jails you can't get in? They'll never let you in. You're not getting in that jail for him. Well, what you is, Lord? You're not getting in. Baptized, man. Please. Well, I hope somebody might be another saint that can baptize and that's in the church. So you can't, you, can't all, you can't look at everything from a physical standpoint, brethren. You have to understand the thought is, is that 
What does the word mean? What is the visitation about? I'm bringing something the individual needs. We pose a thought and it still stands. I haven't got a car yet and I know I'm not. There's no scripture that tells us to go and carry out worship with anyone that's ill, sick. I don't care if leg cut off, you ain't mobile, you can't move. There's no scripture that says that. When you look at this, text tells you they needed visitation. And you're supposed to know what do they lack. What do they lack? They can't worship. See, your heart may go, well, who? See, this, here's, statement, here's statements that are not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. What kind of saint wouldn't want to go and serve his brother and worship with him? See, that's not in the Bible. That What kind of saint will not? See, that's not in the Bible, brother. There's no scripture that reads that. So you have to take the text that God has given you and vow that, okay, well, if he's hungry, what is he hungry for? What is he thirsty for? What does he need clothed on him? Has he taken Christ off? Has he put the old man on? They'll tell you when you call, when you don't see people, you're supposed to know what's, well, finally, that's finally, hey, has anybody, has anybody seen Brother ABC? You want to do spiritual work? Here it is. Anybody seen CBS? Anybody seen CBS? I had never, no, I, go by. I went by his house, he wasn't there. Well, you're not married, have no spouse, no, we can call the children, live in California. Really? Well, that's how that's from. Where was his job at? This would be like, man, I don't know where. If he loved Jesus, nobody calling him, telling me to come to church. See, that's a bad attitude. If you, if that's how you think, nobody calling me, telling me to come to church, that's a bad attitude. Because you don't know what it means to be hungry, thirsty, yet, but it's coming. Unclothed, in prison, sick. So you're telling me a person who wants to commit suicide is not sick? Their body is in better shape maybe than yours and mine put together. So they're sick and we don't understand that they have a different type of sickness than we would think. Well, let's look up that one. See, see the idea is when a person thinks about imprisonment, the individual mind needs to revert back to all the other spiritual things that are said here. Put on the old man, put on a new man, take the old man out. That don't even make sense to them. What kind of old man? But if you're thinking spiritually, my old ways, it's like a coat. I zip it up, and that's what it's called. I put it back on, for you know it, I'm back in the club looking at pornography, smoking some cigarettes that are not uh, cool filter kings, the kind of stuff that gets you drunk and high. Doing that, I'm doing this. Teaching false doctrine again. Ooh, that's a Lulu. I'm teaching false doctrine again. See, the idea is the individual is ill. And infirmity is used. The same type of word for infirmity for my physical ailment is the same word dealt with on the spiritual level. Only it's about the soul. And that's why when Jesus talked to the disciples at a certain point, he would tell them, are you too without understanding? You ought to have this by now. He said, you think I'm talking about food? When he said that, he said, you think I'm talking about food? He said, what about the loaves? I turned food into a lump of the feet. Everybody he said, you think I'm talking about food? Rather you think the Lord talking about physical? Absolutely not. That's not going to judge your soul. Some people don't even have funds. And things to go and do this multiplicity. This is an individual act done by every son. And it must be carried out. You got to carry it out, brother. It's not no church where the brethren, the brethren can't do this one for you. See, you got to do this. This is every sheep judged on all these areas. You must bring meat. You must bring drink. You must visit sick. You must go to those who are in prison. See, the idea is what are they shackled up in? Those that are naked, what do they lack? And that's the spirituality. And that's why the man says, if you can't get this, he says, how are we going to tell you heavier things about Jesus? You understand the impact of eternal judgment is based on you could not deliver spirituality? That's the thing that the Lord gives us. It is our power spiritual review of a soul and enlightenment and a energetic shot in the arm and man they okay now the world can't bring this and that's why he says clearly what does he say verse number 
35 was a hunger, you gave me meat. Thirsty, you gave me drink. The stranger, you took me in naked, you called me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous say unto him, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger and fed thee, a thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, a naked and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto him, Truly I say unto you, insomuch as you have done one of the least of these. Here's a key word, my brother. You'll preach all the way till the Lord come back. My brethren. You have done it unto me. This is the saints. Gotta, you've got to take care of the saints' spiritual needs, brethren. Yeah, you'd be crazy to go be warm and feel the man don't have no food. That's, that's, a, that's an easy kill. Spiritual needs. See, you've got to be prepared. Always be ready to give an answer to the reason of the hope that is in you. We have got to grab this and understand what the Lord is talking about. Now, we're going to pull up one more here. And we're ready to wrap this up. This package is ready. It'll be yours in a few minutes. Sick. What is he sick? What's making him sick? What's making her sick? What's ailing them? What is the problem with this person's precious soul whereby they cannot function? G772. G772. It says, strength of this. Listen at that, brethren. Strength of this. In various application. Here's our key words again. Literally or figurative. That's what we're looking for. And morally. Oh, we've added a new one. See, because when you're sick, it can be figuratively sick on a spiritual level, but I can be morally sick. See, I can be morally sick, brethren. In my spirit, I just think evil. See, that's Matthew chapter 5. Think about having relationships outside of the relationship already. Or I should be even thinking that way because I'm single. So I'm sick morally. I'm morally corrupt inside. You know, boy, if they say something to me again, oh, I almost knocked them in the head with that chair. Girl, you better be glad the law was with me. Man, I tell you what, dude, if the law was me, I'd have bust him in his head with that hammer. See, you're morally corrupt. You want to kill somebody because they said something to you? You're immoral. See, that's a moral issue. To take life, brethren, is a moral issue. No, do it strength. You're morally corrupt. To kill? The Lord says in John the epistle, if you just hate your brother, you're a murderer. And he says, and we know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Spiritual, spiritual. And so, what else does it say? More feeble, impotent, sick, without strength, weak. Because this word has a figure to me, now we can say, okay, if we look at these, all you say, oh man, yeah, he's talking about he's talking about spiritual thing because he says, watch what he says, brethren. This is the beauty of it. My brethren. That's your key word. See, dealing with the spirit. What does the brethren have that the world doesn't have? Spiritual walk. So you go and fix that spiritual walk. Spiritual. Brethren. Look up Jesus and see if he calls the world his brethren. Look it up and see what he says. My brethren, my brethren, those that are mine. He said, now, so, now does that mean, so Jesus is in everybody? No, brethren. Jesus is not in everybody. He's in the righteous. And because he's in the righteous, at that gathering, he's in the midst of them. In the midst of my brethren, what I'm saying. So then, does he go to the Baptist church? He's in the midst of them singing? When I was in the Catholic church, was he in the midst of us singing? Because we're not his brethren in that state. Brethren. And you should have such a drive to be concerned about what your brethren lack. It should push you so. Just like if you had a relative with one of these physical issues. How would you feel if you knew your physical brother was naked? You say, man, I saw a guy on the street. He had, you know, he had gold earrings. He had gold earrings. He said, yeah, and, it, and had the name on there. Blankety blank on name like a name of a and you say, that's my last name. Did he have gold? Huh? Yeah, spray painted gold with a red dot. That's my brother. He's totally naked. Mm. What's the matter? You're gonna check it out, aren't you? Because you're concerned. And you should be driven like that about your spiritual brethren. 
more so than anyone else. And so finally he said, Then shall he say unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, and to everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angel. For I was a hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hunger or thirst, or strange or naked, or sick or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Truly I say unto you, insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You think the Lord expects T.D. Jakes? Of Benny Hinn to take the gospel to someone who is a saint, who is off center. What do he hasn't given the Paul to help him yet? Then why does he reject the twelve who were baptized in Acts 19? He didn't give that teacher the power to say this so, but he gave it to Paul. He's holding Paul accountable to tell them the truth and baptize them. Brethren, you can't save nobody if you don't have the power. Somebody, we were talking about that this morning. Somebody said, well, man, you know, see, they don't even baptize in the Catholic Church. They can. If they did, it didn't mean anything. They don't have the power to save because it hasn't been given unto them. The keys are given to the saints. And we have to know that. We have to embrace that and understand. And if you believe that and you're willing to accept that and you're willing to receive that, at this point in time, the opportunity is yours. If you desire to put Christ on in baptism, to become one of these individuals who can receive the word of God, who can take it in and be uplifted and be encouraged and be strengthened. If you're prepared for that now, God is ready to rescue your soul. Don't wait, don't delay, don't put off. You listen to this message. You can call the number that is posted and we will find something we've done before in this country and in other countries. It can be done. Believe that. There are faithful saints everywhere and they'll get up in the middle of the night and baptize you. Yes. Yes, they will. And you can be saved right now. If you're in this audience now, when we sit down, you stay standing to recognize you want to be baptized. We need a noble confession. I believe Jesus Christ is God. And that's it. It's a done deal. We take it to the water. Take in the spirit of the Lord. Spirit to you. Believe that the Lord with all your heart will rescue you. And he will. Opportunity is yours. You acknowledge Jesus died, bear on the third day, rose again. You believe that? Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Not might shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. If you embrace that and you receive that into your heart, the Lord is clear in Acts chapter 2 as he speaks through Peter. They say, verse 37, me and brethren, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise unto you and your children, all that are fall, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In many other words, he testified and encouraged them. Save yourself from this untoward, that means perverted generation. Then they glad to receive his word. They were baptized the same day. 3,000 souls added unto them. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine of breaking of bread and in prayers. The scriptures are clear. And the Lord adds to the church daily, such should be saved. Acts 2 47. Paul says the Holy Spirit does all the work. 1 Corinthians 12 13. But by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. If you believe that, and understand that. The eunuch was so happy. In Acts chapter 8. He saw water. See his water. What well, does he mean to be baptized? Well, Philip knows. Okay now it's heavier than this water man. If you believe with all your heart you may. He says I believe Jesus Christ the son of God. And he baptized him. And he went away. And the eunuch went back rejoicing. Jesus said through Peter, it saved 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. The life figure of even baptism now saves us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but as the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven, angels, authorities, and powers are subject to him. Made something to him. I love that word, made. The God of heaven made them bow down to Jesus because he is his son. And you believe that? Amen. Look what Jesus said. Revelation 2, 10. He said, the devil shall cast on you into prison. That's not a real jail in all cases. But it is spiritual trying. Ten days, he says. Ten days to be tested. He says, be faithful unto death and you receive everlasting life. You know what the Lord, you think the Lord will let you stay in jail by yourself? Talk about a visitor. He'll be there. Spiritual prison, he'll be there. 
He'll find a saint to go in there. The one that don't want to go, the Lord will take care of that one too. He'll be there. He'll let you know. You know, when you, when you go and you visit people, some of you saints, you're so wonderful, but you discredit what you do. You go to the hospital and you just spend a few minutes there. And when you leave, you have lifted that soul up so high. You go to a funeral and you go, well, I don't know. Got to shake their hand and wave. Got them in a the car. Man, they sick. I've been there. They sick. I've seen it. Wave uh, uh, Talk about it for them. Boy, you see old so and so came to the funeral. Oh, that little boy that gave me a shot long. Oh, yeah. You thought it wasn't the devil over there. Well, no, he's a lie. If he let you think it's something, he know you're going to keep doing it. So they're trying to discourage. Don't let that fool win. It's an encouragement. You call a person, hey, I didn't see you, son. Are you okay? Yeah. Oh, man. That just blocked out whatever they were thinking. Yeah. And now they're ready. Brethren, don't discredit what you do. You have to be behind no pulpit. Right. From your mouth, from your spirit, you can uplift. That's right. Whatever you need, if you need prayer, come down while together we stand in some devil's invitation.